All right, 1899. Put malaria. Just put malaria. You will remember what it means. Write neatly and smallly, 1899 A.D. A.D. C.E. The last page, or next to last page, or last page of your timeline. Now let me tell you a quick story. And you want to take notes on this. Significance of discovery to historians, B. Start taking notes there. Before I tell you the discovery, I want to tell you that what dynasty should our song technically start with, according to legend? What, the, the, according to legend? Xia, right? That's why I said put it in quotes, because it's a legend. Historically, we have no evidence of it. That's why our song starts with the Shang. Now, this is interesting. Now, you want to practice your note-taking skills. Bullet forms, notes, outlines, not complete sentences. Until 1899, the Shang dynasty was also what we put in quotes. It was considered legendary. We had no proof of the Shang dynasty. We only had proof of the Zhou dynasty. Z-H-O-U. I will just tell you, you already have seen the evidence of the Zhou dynasty that proves its existence. There's much, but you've already seen one of the major things. What's that? Come on. The Xu Jing. It's on your timeline. That's a Zhou <coughs> dynasty text. Well, the Xu Jing talked about Yao Shun and Yu. The Xu Jing talked about Yao Shun and Yu, but it, only one other book talked about the Yao Shun and Yu, and that was from the Han Dynasty. Your timeline is useful, whether you realize it or not yet. I'm going to ask you to tell me when Yao Shun and Yu were said to live. Look at your timeline. Your time's up. They're said to have lived around 2300 to 2200 BCE, or even before, right? The Xu Jing itself, how much later was that written? Over a thousand years. I'm writing about, okay, let's write about a guy named Bob in the year uh, 1012. Bob was six feet tall and had blue eyes. Do you believe me? I wrote it down. Do you believe me? No. There's not, that's not enough proof that Bob a thousand years ago existed, just because I wrote it down. In the same way, the Xu Jing talking about guys, sage kings, who are said to have lived over a thousand years earlier, that did not persuade historians. Nor did their stories of the Shang. Put on your timeline, Wu Ding, W-U-D-I-N-G. To help yourself, hey, remember, always write small and clearly, right? Write neatly on these. King Wu Ding, 1250. And Lady Fu Hao. Those of you who want to pronounce the Zhou Zhao, notice A-O is Ao. Fu Hao. A-O is Ao. So King Wu Ding and Lady Fu Hao, his queen or concubine, I'm not sure on that detail, and it doesn't really matter for our purposes. 1250 BCE, thank you. Next, on 100 BCE, I won't be throwing a lot of names at you, but this is a History of China course. Sorry that they don't have English names. You're going to have to deal with that. I won't throw too many, but if I do throw them, they're important. Trust me. Sima Qian, S-I-M-A, Sima Qian, Q-I-A-N. You've seen Q and Qin and Qing, so that Q is a ch sound. Sima Qian, 100 BCE. He wrote a book called the Shirji, S-H-I-J-I, which is translated as the records of the grand historian. Go ahead and put your mark for the Han Dynasty on your timeline. Put your mark for the Han, Han Dynasty and show that it starts. On your timeline and the timeline row in the middle. The, Shu, the Han Dynasty, when does the Zhou Dynasty end? How good are your memories? You memorize this. When is it? The Zhou ended in 220. The Han starts in 200. So at 200, draw a solid line and put Han. 200 BCE. I'm moving on. So, so King Wu Ding and Lady Fu Hao, riddle me this. 
the Xu Jing says that they existed 250 years earlier. And Sima Qian's Shiji, records of the Grand Historian, said they existed. And that was 1,200 years later, 1,100 years later. Is that enough evidence? Two books written centuries after saying that this king and his lady existed and were historically true. Is that enough evidence to convince a historian? What do you think? Who knows, who knows, some of you are history, uh, historically, like, some of you are educated, you're impressive, I'm reading your blogs, you know a lot of stuff. So, which of you know the, the Greek father of philosophy, I'm sorry, of history? The guy who started, like, writing real, real history, like, I don't believe this until I have evidence. It started with ancient Greece for us. Nope. Nope. Those are both philosophers, they're Greek. Her, Hera, Herada, Herodotus. You never heard of Herodotus? No. Okay. Anyway, this guy, and I'm just putting this here because all three of these volumes are the Shirji, and that's not even all of it. This is, oh my God, this is, uh, there it is, you're looking at it. This is the most respected historical work in Chinese history. The guy's amazing. He's got a story, we'll come back to him. Please take some tissues for spillage. Please, please, quick, come on, Madison. Move with a purpose, moving like old people. Take a couple. You guys take five or six because you're just <laughs> ate up. You're a soup sandwich. And if you've ever tried to like put soup on a sandwich, you know it doesn't work. Chase, that's another military uh, phrase, soup sandwiches. All right. Okay, so somebody tell me what I've just set up for you regarding the Shang Dynasty and Wu Ding and Fu Hao. What have I just set up? Thanks, Anushka. What have I just set up? No, thanks for thanks for starting it, Jan. I assume you're going to tell us about a discovery someone made in, 19, in 1899 <clears throat> that shows that they were actually true. And if they were actually true, what does that do? And here's here's the key. What does that do to the status of? It, it gives credibility to the records. What else does it give credibility to in terms of our dynasties? Yeah. I just told you. I just told. Thank you, the Shang. I just told you that until 100 years ago, the Shang dynasty was also in quotation marks because historians didn't really think it existed. So watch this. A guy in, 1800, in 1899, here's the story. A guy in 1899 has malaria. He goes to a traditional Chinese pharmacist. And the traditional Chinese pharmacist gives him traditional Chinese medicines called dragon's teeth. You gotta love traditional Chinese medicine. Here, have some teeth of a dragon. That'll fix you right up. He takes the dragon's teeth home, unwraps them from his little paper wrapping, pulls them out, and sure enough, they look like teeth. They're just these little enamel-like things. Um, and the, the pharmacist said, grind them into a paste with a, mess, a pestle and mortar, and mix it with tea or water or something, and drink it. You'll feel better in the morning. Take two dragon's teeth, call me in the morning. And as he's about to do it, he starts looking at him. This guy is, and this is, this is, this is a great story. It's an amazing story. China's, China's discoveries are always, often, amazing. The guy happened to be a Chinese scholar official. He worked for the Qing emperor. He, what, that means he passed the Confucian civil service exams. He was a scholar and bureaucrat. He worked for the emperor as a, as a political official, a, a bureaucracy official. So. Again, in China, as you'll see very soon, if you work for the government, that means by definition you're a scholar because you pass something that makes the SAT look like saying you're ABCs, right? The Confucian civil service exams. These things are crazy hard. You have to memorize the Confucian classics, the Xu Jing, the Shi Jing, all sorts of stuff in order to pass this test. Memorize it and be able to talk about it. So he's a scholar. Being a scholar, when he pulls out these dragon's teeth and is about to uh, powder them up, he notices some funny scratches on them. Like, not just like accidental scratches, but like etchings. And he's like, what the hell? And he looks at them closer and he's like, this, this, looks, like, this looks like Chinese characters. And he goes back to the pharmacy and he pulls out another one. That looks like Chinese characters too. Not all of them did, just a few of them. And he had to look at it really closely. So he goes back to the pharmacist and he's like, where did you get these? And the pharmacist said, I got them in Anyang which is a, a village close to the city he was in, Zhengzhou. And so being a scholar, being curious, and, and 
uh, you know, just curious and like, what's going on here? He goes to Anyang with his friend, another scholar. Chinese scholars are fun. They have a sense of humor. They're very different from Western scholars who don't. Ha <laughs> uh, ha Huh? Anyang, A-N-Y-A-N-G. There's a museum there today that um, is there for the reason I'm about to tell you. He goes to Anyang. The, the, it's just a peasant village, just a bunch of peasants. And he asks the peasants, where, where are the, what are these dragon's teeth? And they're like, oh, they're, they're not dragon's teeth. They're, uh, we, just, we just found a bunch of old bones, and we just break them up with a hammer and um, call them dragon's teeth and sell them to the pharmacist. Peasants can't read. You have to understand that. Chinese characters, there's 4,000 of them or more. And peasants don't have time to memorize 4,000 characters. Those of you taking Chinese know it's ridiculous, crazy hard. So peasants don't read. And the guy's like, well, can you tell me where you found these things? And they do. And this is what they take him to. I forgot to hit on pause when I said, uh, OK, so uh, penis equals ancestor. Put that in your notes. And um, logograph, Middle Kingdom, Zhong, uh, is a logograph because it's a line going through a rectangle that shows the idea of middle. It's not a picture of a thing. That's a pictograph. A logograph is a picture of an idea. And so, OK, so this guy had discovered that in this area where the peasants were brick shattering these things, you've got to think about it, century after century after century, peasants had been digging these up, sledgehammering them, but first polishing them because dragon's teeth don't have etchings on them. So they're, they're sanding all of this stuff off hundreds of years and hundreds more and hundreds more because these things are 3,250 years old. They're from the Shang Dynasty. Stop. Put that in your notes. This is the earliest form of writing in Chinese history. This is the earliest document in Chinese history. And it's written on turtle shells and cattle uh, shoulder blades, scapula blades. They're called oracle bones. I'm going to move on. Oracle bones, that is one of your key terms. You're not educated in Chinese history if you don't know oracle bones. What's an oracle? Tells you the future. If you've seen The Matrix, Keanu Reeves goes, Neo goes to the, the oracle, the lady, you know, black lady who's baking cookies. She can, she's an oracle. She's a soothsayer. So, um, so there's a joke here. Oh, first of all, so what do we see on these oracle bones? Questions. For example, oh great penis, I mean, oh great ancestor. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm really emphasizing this not just because it's fun, it is, but also because it's important, it's meaningful, it's significant. So I want you to catch this. What's, uh, oh great ancestor, why am I getting a toothache? Are you mad at me? That's, what, that's the type of thing. Questions are, are scratched into these bones, and this is how it worked. They would, the, the, the Shang King, all right, this is seriously important. I want to see pen up. The Shang King, pour yourself some tea if you need energy. The Shang King would have a scribe next to him, a ritual uh, assistant next to him. Are you a one-fingered typist, Cal? The Shang King would have a scribe next to him, a ritual, a ritual assistant. The assistant would, type, would, would scratch the questions into the oracle bone, and then they would get, they would, with a chisel, they would put a hole in the oracle bone, just, just a, little, a little wedge into the oracle bone. And then they would heat a, a, a metal poker until it was red hot and, took, and take the tip of that red hot metal poker and stick it into that little notch that they made in the bone. And what's that going to do? I've got a red hot poker in me and I'm just a bone or a shell. What's it going to do to it? Crack it. And they would read the cracks. Don't ask me how, because we don't know. Or at least I don't. Yeah, it's a kind of, t yeah, it's just a, you know, it's a fortune telling thing. Very similar to horoscopes. Oh, the stars are up there right now. That means this is going to happen. So it was magical thinking. And a very important detail here. The king answered. The king interpreted the crack. In Western culture, what social type of character would probably interpret anything having to do with divination. Notice the word divine, God, in divination. What kind of character? Probably not a king, thank you, a priest. Notice what you're seeing in China. Who's the priest here? 
This is hugely important. The king is the priest. This is hugely important. The king is the priest. There is no priest class in China. East-West comparisons, this is hugely important. There is no religious authority separate from political authority. They are one and the same. A handy label for this is simply priest hyphen king, because that's what he is. He's a priest king. OK, so the questions. Question C in your notes. You've just discovered what oracle bones are. Um, here's the question. If the Shang Dynasty was legendary, please listen, Jackson. If the Shang, I want you to discuss this question and make sure that you all get it. If the Shang, if the Shang, if the Shang Dynasty was legendary until just a hundred years ago, listen, the Chinese were, were always saying, "Oh, the Shang Dynasty existed, right? We've got it in these books." And historians are saying, "That's not enough. We don't believe you. It's probably false. It's just legend." And a hundred years, and we said that for two thousand. Well, no, we didn't. We said it for four hundred years, fifteen hundred until nineteen hundred. And then this happens, and we're like, damn, the Chinese were right. We found evidence that they're right. Their legend turned out to be history. It's a no-brainer question. What does that make interesting about right now? We're saying, oh, the Shah is probably just a, leg a legacy, a legend, a legend. We're waiting for a discovery that will have something on it, saying, making us go once again, like in 1899, wow, like Chinese legends. Will we find something with Yu's name written on it from 2,000 years ago? That's one of the, it's one of the sort of suspense questions of China watchers. China watching is fun for these. While I'm filling the tea, I'll just tell you. I may have told you before. The fact that China is only now modernizing means that they are digging up and constructing skyscrapers and new cities and bridges and railroads and everything, you know, high-speed rail. That means they're digging up so much earth, and they're finding archaeological stuff all the time because it's 3,000 year old history. And it's just that they're finding tombs, they're finding uh, all sorts of stuff. So it's a really, really cool thing to keep up with Chinese archaeology. Do you have any questions on how the oracle bones work? <coughs> yeah. I wonder about how they work, but was the scholar when Mary was in China? He, he was Chinese, yeah, he was, a, he was a scholar official. That normally means that you are Chinese, not always. But yeah, normally you're Chinese because you're reading Chinese in order to be that. There are hundreds of them all over Anyang, and they're massive, like the size of this room. Okay. Picture a trash pit, okay, you know, where are we going to take all these bones after we filled them up with, with prophecies, with oracles? Just throw them in the pit, right? It's like a trash pit. And then they dig them up. It's like our landfills today with garbage, right? Um, so they're all over the place. What does that prove to us? One of the names on it, keep going, one of the names on those bones is Wu Ding. King Wu Ding's, these, the bones that we found are King Wu Ding asking his ancestors, are you mad at me? I have a toothache. Other questions he asked. Why am I having nightmares? Are you mad at me? Should we attack the nomads or the, the barbarians tomorrow or next week? That sort of thing. So any sort of questions, both of personal things, why am I having nightmares, or political things? Is this a lucky day for us to invade or wage war? Those are the types of questions asked. Divination again, too divine. I'm looking at our study guide. Too divine, to, to, to tell the future. The king's role again, priest-king, in a nutshell. You should show that you can understand that. Now let's talk about the ancestors and Shangdi. Good time to refill the teapot.
This is my very professional graphic illustration of the way that Chinese Shang religion worked. This is the Shang King. Now, the Shang King used oracle bones with only the assistance of a ritual assistant to write in them. And he read them. And he's asking questions to whom? Mind you, this is the important key detail. Who is he asking the questions to? No, no, the oracle is the act, the king himself is the oracle because the oracle reads the future, the king's reading the cracks. But who is he asking to tell him the future? If you said Sean B or God, you're wrong. This is the hugely important thing because he is asking instead the penises. Not the vaginas, the penises. <laughs> this is important. What does this show about the uh, sort of gender roles? Males are, Males are dominant. Who are the important ancestors? The male. You want, okay. And so this is the, our final thing. The role of ancestors is where we are here. Who and what role did they play? The ancestors were thought, when they died, and, and now I want to remind you of a couple things in the Shu Jing that you read and just in case you forgot them, I understand that. I've only read it once, I've read it a million times. There was a minister in the, the court, uh, the, the Shun's bureaucracy, the minister of the temple of the accomplished ancestors. So it is the ancestors of the king who are thought when they die, so the, the former kings, when they die, they go to hang out with the high god, Shambi, the high god. Don't be confused with Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. This god is not a creator of the universe. This god is more like Zeus. He controls flood, storm, rain, and other natural things. A pagan god. I'm answering these two questions at once. Shambi, a nature god. A Zeus type. The ancestors, their royal ancestors, that when they die, basically go to his court and are his courtiers. When you're ready to move on, just lift up a finger, a thumb, so I can tell. Not a finger, a thumb. Especially not the middle one. Don't care how you feel. Keep it to yourself. Hurry up. Ancestors, royal dead people. Shang Di, nature god. King. Priest king. Shang Di. Who can talk to Shang Di? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to answer that question right now. Who can communicate with Shang Di directly? Amongst yourselves, who can directly? Okay, so who can talk to the who who can talk directly to Shangdi? No one? The king cannot. Listen. Listen. This is the important thing. If you got it wrong, get it right now. Who is the who is the, the living Shang King asking questions to? His ancestors. Notice he is not asking Shang Di. He's asking his ancestors. Now, Shang Di is a high god. He's the one that's making you have a toothache. He's the one that is making the, the drought or the flood. But who is he? The only person that Shang Di talks to is the dead ancestors. They are there around him, like a king with his court. And they're family members of the Shang King. So I'm asking my, my dead grandpa, great grandpa, and on back to the beginning of the <coughs> dynasty, questions. Because they know Sean B. Put this into a... No, okay. That's, is this clear? If it's not, put a question mark so I can make sure it's clear because this is hugely important. <clears throat> now, if I am continuing, 
how do I make my, what happens if my dead ancestors, who are up here with God, think that I'm a jerk, a bad king, a disrespectful king, an unfilial king, a king who doesn't respect his ancestors. I don't do the rituals well to my ancestors, the ancestral rituals. I don't do them well, because I'm a loser, I don't care, I'm lazy. What's the consequence of that? Speak amongst yourself. I have disrespected my ancestors by not carrying out the ancestral rituals. What is the consequence of this for me and my kingdom? Speak to yourselves. Well, if you don't honor your uh, ancestors, they're going to be mad at you. They're going to give that information on to you who will then reward you for things like the weather, like how to pick it Okay, who's got a good answer? <laughs> Raise your hands quick. We've got to get through this. What are the consequences of me if I dishonor my ancestors and I'm the king? Thank you, Chase. The ancestors put in a bad word for you and Sean Thank you. The ancestor tells Sean he's a jerk. And, what's, and so the consequence of that? Bad stuff happens to you. Bad crops, any number of things. Weather. Bad weather. Earthquakes. Unsuccessful wars. We, you know, the Mao beat us. Whatever. When I say Mao, are we? Are, do we remember the Mao tribe? M I A O. They're the ones that you decided uh, the way to beat them is to stop fighting them and just show them that we're civilized and they'll want to come. Yeah. So if there's yeah. a natural calamity, then the king's fault. I mean, people getting angry at the king. If Shangi controls nature, if Shangi <coughs> is, is happy, he should make nature like good to us. If he's unhappy, it's easy to infer that, or if, if nature is bad, it's easy to infer that he's unhappy. Primitive superstition, right? I don't know. We're mixing it, but anyway, these are these are two fine teeth, so enjoy them. You're getting a sample. Thanks again, Jan. That's really nice. So my last question is this, and this is your blog post, part of it. Discuss amongst yourselves. I'm not going to. I'm not going to spoon feed you. This analogy: Shang kings were like the Western blanks because this should answer it for you very clearly. This guy is like a Western blank because. Discuss. Last man standing works like this. Listen closely. <coughs> You're out of your seats. Blood is circulating down into your legs and up from your rumps. Um, last man standing is this. You answer a question. I'm going to go around. When, and as soon as somebody else gives the answer that you had in your head, sit down. If you're still standing up, that means you've got something left, left to add. All right? Clear? If he says what you were going to say, you sit down. If he doesn't, you still stand it. Last man standing has the last idea. Uh, so go. What do you, what's, what's your answer to this? Priest. Priest. Thank you. Sit down. Cal. Pope. Pope. Thank you. <laughs> Priest or Pope? Hayden? Um, I say Pope, but during, before the Protestant Revolution as the Pope. Listen to this. This is a very, very, very... <laughs> A level uh, distinction before the Protestant Reformation because um, because the Pope was all powerful politically, yet all powerful religiously, like the king. That's right. Undivided political and religious power. <laughs> <laughs> Jiffy. No, I'm kidding. Sean. Yeah. Um, I said a messenger. A messenger. Okay, sit down. <laughs> Um, the Pope. The Pope. Moving on, we have until 9.30. We're making good time. Uh, 
Okay, I, I'm, throwing at the, I'm throwing at you these. I've already told you the difference between pictographic and logographic. There it is, back on your note thing. Go down to box two, script, Chinese script, writing system. What is pictographic in a nutshell? Please, somebody, thank you. Picture representing a meaning. Picture representing a meaning. No, not a meaning. A thing. A thing. An actual, like, solid thing. What's the image for a tree, for example? I don't write characters, I'm a barbarian, but I think it's something like this, isn't it? It's like yeah. Close enough. That's a picture of a tree. Look, that's close enough. All right, I'm a barbarian. Now, so this is a thing. Picture of a thing. Pictograph. Okay? Now. This is a picture of an idea. Middle. Logos. Idea. Logograph. So these two things are how the Chinese system, writing system works. Pictures of ideas and pictures of things. That's why we call it both pictographic and logographic. Please know those. I want you to be able to talk intelligently and, and advancedly about China. I want you to be educated. Your next question is this. The argument has been made. Hear this, it's awesome. The argument has been made Pull out your timelines, real quick. Real quick, go to 200 CE. I'm sorry, 220 CE. That means you've got to find where the numbers are going up, not going down across the page. 220 CE. Draw a line, that's the end of the Han Dynasty. 220, the Han ends. No, on your timeline, on your uh, dynasties bar, yes. On your dynasties bar, it says China, dynasties here. Just draw a line marking the end of the Han. So at 220, you should draw this and put Han, I'm sorry, end of Han and the beginning of the POD. Clear? Han ends 220. POD, period of disunity, begins. Next, move over to, for your western timeline, 476, call it 500, who cares? If you want to be exact, 476 is a traditional date. Roman Empire ends, 476 CE, Roman Empire ends, and that will be on your western timeline. No, don't put it right there. Okay, yeah, good, okay. And down here, uh, you can draw a line, Roman Empire ends, and medieval starts, or dark ages start. Let me help. So, 476, Rome falls, and the Dark Ages. <coughs> Medieval. Here's the last thing I want you to put. I want you to put the end of these two medieval periods for both. So the Roman, the, the medieval, the Dark Ages, this is, the Dark Ages put about a thousand, a thousand CD for Europe. Dark Age ends. That's the beginning of the, the what we call the high, uh, the the late medieval, because Europe starts coming out of its pit of just absolute disgrace. It actually like starts having like markets again. They had no markets for 500 years. You couldn't go buy anything in Europe, a bar of soap, at a market for 500 years. There was no civilization. They were living in their little castles with walls because it was so disgracefully horribly disintegrated. Um, so things start, Europe starts like coming out of that disaster in the late medieval period, 1000 to 1300.
And finally, the period of disunity, going back to China. Our years are going to be 220 to about 600 CE. China's POD, period of disunity. You've already put the 220 CE, it ends in 600. centuries of that. Roughly, you know, round it off. Four centuries, 400 years, <coughs> there was no such thing as China. It was disunited, that's why we call it the period of disunity. How long did the dark age of medieval, early medieval Europe last? Are you with me? Drink tea. How long did the dark age, how many centuries did the dark age of medieval Europe last? The, the dark age. Those of you who said a thousand, you're wrong. Five hundred, from some roughly five hundred CE until about a thousand CE. So again, the east-west comparisons, which you wouldn't get in a textbook, and by God, I'm going to resent you if you keep saying I'd prefer just to read a textbook. The one or two of you who are saying that in the uh, in the anonymous feedback forums, the textbook will not give you this stuff. They'll just give you a bunch of dry stuff. Look at that. The Han Empire, the Roman Empire. They're both the first largest empires, east and west. They both last for about four or five hundred years. They both collapse into disunity for over four hundred years each. Europe much longer. But China had a similar four hundred year stage where there was no guarantee that there would ever be such a thing as China again. There has never been a Roman Empire since. There has never been a united Europe since. There's no such thing as Europe today. A nation named Europe. That was once not true. There was a nation or a state named Roman Empire. And it was all of Europe, except for the northern barbarians and such. So, at one point, Europe was a state. It was unified. At one point, China was a state, the Han. It was unified. They both broke down. 400 years later, China put itself back together again. That's called the Sui and Tang dynasties. And ever since, there has been one China. There is not a Europe today. There has never been, since Rome fell, a unified Europe. Here is the argument that has been made. It is China's writing system, pictographic and logographic, that is responsible for Europe's, um, for China's unity. If they had an alphabetic system, there would probably not be a China today. There would probably be 20, 30, 40 countries in China. No unified China. Who can unriddle that? Let me help first by saying, you are Turks in China, you are Miao, savages that uh, you fought in China, you are um, southern savage Chinese, you're Han Chinese, you're the civilized ones, you are um, Tibetans, and you are um, Vietnamese, and you are uncivilized Koreans, I don't care what I told you. <coughs> Now, because the Koreans couldn't read or write at this time. But, <clears throat> okay, Koreans, what is this? Cat. It's a cat. Say it in Korean. Huh? Boyangi. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tibetans, what is this? Cat. Say it in Tibetan, make it up. Thank you. <laughs> what are you? Oh, okay. Okay, you southern savages. What is this? Look at it. Tell me what it is in English. Okay, and, and your language is? Thank you. And you? Turks? Or meow, or whatever you are? What is that? Okay, but in your language? Thank you. <laughs> now, you are... Danes? No, no, you're Vandals. 
You're Visigoths. You are, give me another Roman barbarian, or European barbarian tribe. Goths. Goths. You're Gauls. You're, 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 you're Anglo-Saxons. And I am a Roman. I am a Roman emperor, and I've conquered all of you. And I said, here I come with my alphabet. You're going to learn Latin. So here, your first lesson. This should be obvious to you. What's your tribe? Quick, what's your tribe? Danish. Help me. I just told you what you were. Jesus. Huh? Huh? Danish. Okay. What does this mean in Danish? Do you think this, is, this means cat in Danish? Do you think it means cat in your barbarian tongue? In yours? In yours? In yours? In yours? What problem does the, the Roman Empire have with the alphabet compared to the West alphabetic script? What problem is an alphabet when you are an empire trying to unify people? It's not visual. Huh? It's not visual. It's not visual. So that's, that's, a, that's not a huge problem the way you're saying it. It's, What's the problem here? It's not indicated. I'm, a, I'm an emperor trying to unify an empire. What's my problem here? In the simplest terms, get the big idea. Thank you, Chase. can't spread your idea around easily. I can't because? It's one language that's foreign to anybody else. Yeah. A Japanese, a Korean, a Chinese, and a Vietnamese, from the beginnings of this language, could read the same. Here's the key point. I mean, this, is, this, this stuns scholars and historians. It stuns me every time I teach it. <coughs> You're Japanese, I'm Chinese, I can't speak to you. But I can do this. And you know that I just wrote jump, right? And you know the language. So they actually had what are called rush conversations on their hands. You still see it today. The Chinese will just write a character on their hand. Uh, to communicate with each other, they have different dialects. Rush conversations, <coughs> because the characters speak across spoken language. That unifies. <coughs> Meanwhile, this doesn't. The alphabet doesn't. I can read cat and Latin but it doesn't help me if I'm German. It divides. The alphabet divides. Notice there all the different European countries use the alphabet for their own language. And they can't write to somebody in their own language and be understood unless that person has learned their spoken language. It's a, it's a, the more you think about it, the more interesting it is. Let me illustrate this a little more. Those of you who say, oh no, it's just that there are so many more European uh, nationalities than Chinese. Let me prove you wrong. Yellow, Sino-Tibetan, uh, Blue, Indo-European, also Asiatic, all these are different language families. And each one has dialects within. There are over 23 different languages in China spoken, but there's one written. Okay? Now I said, for you to do well, when you get home, you pull this out and you think about it for a couple of minutes before you write. It's fascinating. Meanwhile, here's China. Uh, I'm sorry, here's Europe. 23 official languages, just in the European Union. 27 nations. So there's 23 languages, 27 nations. Here, over 20 languages, over 50, <coughs> over 50 ethnic groups. I put this box here to spell it out, but one nation. Why could the Roman Humpty Dumpty, after falling off the wall, never put itself back together again? But the Chinese Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. So I've had students who didn't know Humpty Dumpty, so I have to define that to you. Humpty Dumpty was an egg who fell off a wall and broke. <laughs> and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put, couldn't put him back together again. That's true for Europe. There's still no Europe today. The European Union is failing. <coughs> they don't feel like one, 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 one people, the Europeans. We can't be a union. It's about to dissolve. Greece is leaving, probably others too. This Humpty Dumpty put itself back together again. The argument has been made. It is because of the script, the bibliographic <coughs> and logographic script. How would the penis being ancestor influence you from another culture, Stuart? You're from another culture. You don't have this like big emphasis on the male, but you suddenly you've joined our written script civilization, and you're using that script. And every time you say ancestor and religious ancestor and all this sort of stuff. You're writing, you're writing penis. And you see it, right? 
how is that going to influence your cultural values? Change them into to, into what? Into one, into one that that does gradually, generation by generation. The not just the the, the pictures, but also the ideas, the, the cultural values embedded in the script, will over time start rewiring the hard drive in your mind, so that you have the Chinese values that are embedded in the script too. That is why ancestor could be female, right? But no, not in our culture. It's male. So we're going to say important ancestor, masculine. How can we make that most clear? A bloody penis, right? <coughs> and now every time a new ethnic group speaking a different language with a different culture joins our civilization and learns to write, they are seeing our values as well as, as our script. And since we are the dominant and most civilized culture here on the Yellow River, the richest, the most impressive, the literate, they're going to want also to join us and be like us. Just like many countries today are trying to be like America because they like McDonald's. I'm done. So let me go back now to the, to the blog and show you what your, your homework is. Speak now or forever, hold your peace. Your problem, the Sean King is a monster and everybody is miserable and hates him. Don't pack. Everybody hates the Sean King, but they refuse to join you in rebellion. So your job, explain why. Show me you get the whole point of the Sean King Pope thing. And what you would do, here's the challenge, this is the problem solving thing, this is your thinking. What you would do to persuade people to follow you. Do it in six sentences, I'm not asking for a book, right? Quit. Next, criticize what we just talked about. Really, can we say that a writing system can be responsible for the disintegration of your